And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome. My audience is a little bit small due to the time, but uh, hopefully um, I could please you with, an, with some interesting ideas. And um, if you have questions, you may ask in German also. I will st stay in English because of the English of the video recording and the English audience. So I will translate then any questions uh, when presented in German. So what's the subject of the talk? In theory, it's about costs, but costs is of course not the only thing to obey here. So where's the next slide? Here is it. So this is my agenda. I have. Um, architectural level first, that's the problem space. Of course, the central subject of cost is not all to look at. So there are uh, scaling properties, which is very important for any big storage systems. And of course, um, the second is uh, the reliability. It's the most important, then of course, the third, uh, cost is sometimes often only the, the third one. In a, in a hierarchy. So the, the first three items are about problem space and the next is solution space, of course. Okay. So let's start with one architecture which is proposed throughout the internet and hyped at the moment, which I call big cluster architecture. Let's start from, from the top here. Should I use this half or the other one? for pointing, I use this one, okay. Now let's uh, look, one and one is a web hoster and we have several millions of contracts and several millions of home directory. I think our last, um, my last counting was about more than nine millions of home directories. Okay, now please observe that each home directory is already a separate data space, separate from each other, yes? So your input data, each web contract is already isolated or should be isolated from each other. That means your data set is already partitioned. This is an important property. And now if you want to have a, a cluster architecture at the storage here, you have three layers. The one is the user layer. Then you have some front ends here, which are servicing your requests, your HTTP requests. And then you have a storage network and some storage servers some, somewhere. If you are using a big cluster architecture, then in theory, almost any front end could serve any request from any user. And the same is also true for the storage boxes. That means the data is striped in some way over all of these storage boxes. That's the basic idea of these big cluster architectures. And if you look at it, first you have real time access between your front ends and your storages. Because uh, if something is not in the caches here, in the local caches of your kernel and your front end, it has to be fetched from the storage servers. And this is a real-time access. And the next observation is you have n, you have n machines. You can imagine you have several petabytes of data if, if you have millions of customers and um, several thousands of machines. So this n is bigger than 1,000 here. And what it means to have uh, O of n square connections, at least the number of connections is going with the square. Of course, the traffic itself is scaling up only linearly, but the number of TCP connections, which are open at the same time, is O of n square. And that's the important point to observe here. Okay? This is un understandable, because potentially any of these front end machines can request data from any of the backends, n to n, n to n. Okay? So <coughs> probably this is not the best architecture if you have a data set which is already partitioned. There are some use cases, l l let me emphasize this, uh, which should, which are well, for, uh, well tailored for this architecture. For example, looking at a search engine, any user may enter any search keyword, and then many of the front ends, any of the front ends might be addressed. So it's, it makes a difference whether you, not only your data set, but also your access paths are already partitioned in some way. So for example, if you use Ceph or similar, similar architecture for, for your storage boxes here, there are use cases where Ceph is the optimal solution, but not for our web hosting here, just to make it clear, okay? Now let's look at the 
Oh, something has gone wrong here. There are two, there are two slides. So the next slide is uh, the sharding architecture, known, probably known to some of you. The idea is you have storage plus frontend in one single unit, which may be the same server, but then also may be a storage server, a small storage server and several clients, but in small islands. Even if you have some, some small uh, um, storage network here between them, you have local switches for them. So you have no big O of N square network in between. And now the problem is load balancing here is viewed as the most important problem. And the idea of what I'm doing here is you have a small network, which is only O of M, and it's uh, used for batch migration. So your logical volumes are transferred during operation and during the data is being updated. That's an important point. The data is active, and during that, your data can be migrated to different server for load balancing, or for example, or for hardware life cycles to get rid of your old servers and migrate to newer boxes and so on. The idea is that this migration network is much smaller, it's only O of N, and it's background traffic. So you don't need to dimension your network in such a way that you have plenty of resources for any load peaks. The main problem with Ceph and Co is, or with, with other architectures, uh, similar architectures, is that uh, typical loads from the internet, for example, DOS attacks, DDoS attacks, and similar uh, scenarios, are overloading at the wrong moment, uh, are creating packet storms. And um, TCP is no real-time protocol. It has not been designed for storage networks. It has been designed for nuclear wars, as, as you probably know for, from the history. And this means your TCP send buffer is a queue by concept. So if you, and the only means of congestion control or flow control in your network is packet loss. That's the basic principle of the internet. And this means your storage network from the pre previous slide must be dimensioned in such a way that no incident happens and you don't get queuing. This means it has to be over dimensioned. And for this replication network, um, uh, you, you simply can use background. Uh, so some, some background channel. You can even use traffic shaping here. Okay, now let's look at a comparison of the ideas behind it. How to get reliability, high availability into the system. The classical solution some of you probably already know is DRBD. Who has already used DRBD or similar systems? Okay, three. Four, four people here, okay, thank you. So you know what I'm talking about. If you want to know what Mars is, it's in the same, almost the same as DRBD, but asynchronous. The main difference is that uh, Mars is using transaction logs. So all the updates are first recorded in a sequential log and then transferred in background to the secondary side. So you have pairs of machines, typically. So we have a primary side where you normally are operating, and the secondary side is a passive copy, which is just mirroring the active one. And of course, only w one of them is actually servicing the request, the other one is the backup. And if this distance, the physical distance between these two sides is more than, let's say, 30 or 50 kilometers, then you are typically talking of geo-redundancy. And geo-redundancy means that a whole data center may fail. For example, if you have an earthquake or a similar, or a terrorist attack or whatever, then you can lose your whole data center and you have a complete backup data center where all your data is residing. So you can switch over in cases of emergency. And now let's look at a certain other case where only single nodes are failing. This can occur during normal operations. Um, for at any time, for example, if you have 1,000 servers and a reliability of 99.99%, for four nines in total, then it means uh, you will have about uh, 2,000 hours of downtime in total, of in your total pool per year, about around this. You can comp compute it. It's more than many people uh, imagine. Now let's look at the, no at the case that two nodes are failing at the same time. 
So if they are failing at the same time, here in this architecture, it's no problem if they are on different pairs, because you see this node, this red one is failing, you are just switching over, you have a failover to the other one, and if this one fails, you are failing over to the other pair in the other data center. So it's, it's not a big incident for the, of the whole data center, but only a small incident of your local machine. And all your local disks which are connected to this machine are, of, of course, no longer accessible. If the same happens with the big cluster here, whatever it is, you, you can add other, other names here. These are just examples. If you have two replica here, what will be the problem here? Typically, these uh, replicas, in, in, in case of Ceph, uh, there are objects roughly corresponding to one file or to one block, whatever are using, mode you are using here. When two are failing, you have two replicas, you have a problem because not all of your data is present anymore. And the main difference is here, it matters which node is failing. So the probability for hitting exactly the same pair is much lower. But hitting any of them for producing incident here is much higher by an order of n around it. Okay, so this is the first problem of the big cluster architecture. And the second one, if you have a storage incident at the storage layer, you will likely have also an incident at your client servers, but not of one of them, but almost all of them, because or it, it depends on the data distribution and the, and the hash function and some other effects, but I've written here O of, o of n clients uh, are typically affected or maybe affected at least in worst case. So the spread of your incident is much more, you have a kind of uh, error propagation here throughout this O of n square network. So is it clear to you that, that the architectural impact here is uh, two replicas is not enough here. If, uh, in order to, to compete with this architecture, you need at least three replica, if not four. Okay? Agreement, disagreement somewhere? I think it's, uh, it's clear. For, uh, I, so you need not exact mathematical formulas. You can see it by just looking at the problem. Okay. And now, the question is what does that mean for your costs? Okay, if you have a big cluster here, then you need at least three replicas. This means 300% of disks times three. And uh, by the very construction, you have storage nodes and you have client nodes and they have the same order, O of N, similar numbers. So are using three about three times the number of servers you would need for this model, simple sharding model, is you have just local RAID 6, nothing else. And the data protection is done by the RAID, preferably a hardware RAID controller with PBU cache. This is very important for performance and you have a hardware uh, caching there and a battery backup or some small gold cap capacitor in case of power failure. And uh, the hardware does everything for you. It's a small card, so you are not wasting any H unit here and power consumption is also very small by this model because you have no dedicated storage servers at all, only this one card and this consumes not much power and not much space. Okay, uh, but of course you need a backup, but you need it in both cases because uh, you have no further redundancy. If your whole cluster as such is failing, you have also a problem with this architecture and the probability for failing the whole cluster is not as low as many people are thinking. That's the problem here. So backup, it's, it's no, no substitute for backup, having a big cluster or having rep more replicas in any, in any case. Okay, is this clear? Now the next one is we are looking at geo-redundancy and many people are claiming that geo-redundancy is extremely costly. It produces much cost because everything is doubled. This is true in theory and it's especially true for the big cluster architecture. Some people are believing that you just need to distribute your big cluster into two data centers and then you have geo-redundancy. This is not true because true geo-redundancy is if you have to survive really an earthquake. An earthquake means it takes several months to restore your data center into operations. Okay, this is the scenario we are talking about. Important for insur insurance, for example. So um, if you have a bigger company, 
and you want to survive this, you have to be able to operate, continue operation several, for several months in your second data center. And for this failure scenario, you need at least six replicas here. You have to double all of it. Because otherwise, during your three or four or five months or even one year or whatever it would take to restore, um, you will have the same failure scenarios as if you had one data center. You are just losing half of, half of your total hardware. And in this case, of course, you are also doubling, it's clear, um, but you can use Mars for long distance or DRBD for room redundancy, but then you are, we are no longer talking about uh, big disasters then. And it's clear that uh, even there the cost difference is significant. Okay. Now let's combine it. Um, it's a kind of unfair comparison here, because uh, at the one side we are returning back to the three replicas on one side, no geo redundancy, and on the other side we are using the geo redundancy from the last slide and comparing it this way this time. It's interestingly, even there it is cheaper. That's, that's the key point of the slide here. So this means geo redundancy, you have um, one client is one storage server in best case, and you, okay, you have to double it, and you also need this replication network. But compare it to this side, where you have O of N clients, plus three times your storage servers for three replicas, assuming that one server has the same size and the same number of disks and so on, and your storage network, which is also replicated as a whole throughout the data centers. And in addition, I have forgotten this, you need also a replication network for the geo redundancy. I forgot this. So cost of hardware should be clear to you is a vast difference here. And, but there's a functional difference. Here you have these geo failure scenarios and here you don't have it. So you get even better functionality here, a better insurance against life insurance, uh, you can sleep better. And here you have more costs and uh, less secure system, safe system. And it's possible, this is, I think it's a new idea, I haven't seen it before, uh, but uh, cor please correct me if you know a similar idea somewhere. This is the idea how to even, to make it even cheaper, the geo redundancy. What's the key idea here? It's asymmetric. Um, full geo redundancy means that one your data center is operating 100% CPU power. The other one is almost 0%. Okay, so you are wasting CPU resources there on RAM resources. You are just deploying servers for the case of emergency. So this means doubling the cost is something which could be tried to, uh, to reduce. And the idea is uh, the storage cannot be reduced. The total storage needs times two. No, no chance around this. But for CPU power, the story can become or could become different if you have three data centers, three locations instead of two. And A1 and A2 means uh, this is the primary side here. The primary side is divided into halves. The A1 is replicated here to A1 prime. Green means secondary role by default. The A2 is replicated here. And now the same thing symmetrically. So the Bs are replicated to here and to here. And the Cs from here, here's the primary side, are replicated, secondary sides are these two data centers, symmetrically. Understandable, hopefully. Now what's about CPU consumption? Storage is clear, this is a factor of two, but uh, during normal operations, each data center has 100% CPU for each part. And in case one of them breaks down, let's say data center one has an earthquake and both other, the two other data centers are surviving, then you have to switch over the A1 to here and the A2 to here. That means the CPU consumption of this data center increases only by 50%. It's not doubling. And also it's the same with the other data center. So this means it's a challenge for a system like Mars, how to tackle this, this problem here. How to have a flexible assignment of CPU to storage. Our first model was having a fixed association between storage and CPU power. The first attempt and the second one is how to do it better. 
And this is the next slides here, the basic idea of my talk. Flexible mass, sharding, and cluster on demand, what does it mean? In this example here, we have a hypervisor running on this single storage box. The RAID system is in hardware. We have logical volumes here. And the VMs are either KVM or let's let it be LXC containers or whatever. Okay, running on the same box. The number, of course, can be scaled down, up and down as, as, as you like. And in case the CPU power of this box here, of this hypervisor instance in one of your data centers is not enough, then and you have another one, which is, for example, in the secondary, in the passive role, so um, you have enough, more than enough CPU power, you are switching over, you are exporting this volume here, this mass replicated volume to another one over the local replication network, preferably. But it's an exceptional case. It's, it's not the default. The default is to have the, uh, the VM containers or the containers at the same hypervisor whenever possible. So you have no storage network traffic at all by default. And only in exceptional cases, if you have, a, for example, an attack to a certain machine or whatever happens, or you have this case of emergency breakdown of whatever, then exceptionally, then you are exceptionally using ISCSI or the new feature mass remote device, which should appear during this year, it's not, not yet production ready. So it's, it's just a replacement for ISCSI, a little bit better performance according to my measurements, yes? Yeah, what's the trigger that action? Is that a lot on the system? Is it the management tooling or do you have to do it manually? Uh, just, uh, we, I need one microphone. Please repeat your question yourself, okay? Um, what does it trigger? Yeah. Does it work? Doesn't. I think the microphone doesn't work. You have to switch it on. Here, try it. Uh, what triggers the failover? Uh, what triggers the failover? There are two possibilities if you have really thousands of machines. You wouldn't rely on something like hard heartbeat or the similar. You, you, of course, if you have a low number of clusters, you can do it all automatically. But for one and one, we are preferring the manual method uh, because um, automatic methods are tending uh, to produce some unexpected results. Um, you anyway have a network operating center which has to watch thousands of network connections or of, uh, several dozens of lines, and so on and so on. And uh, there are different type, types of incidents which can be automatically repaired or not, and, and so on. So anyway, we have 24-7 uh, personnel in place. So at the moment, uh, we don't have an automatics there, but uh, in my last slide, I'll come back to, to your question. So uh, for example, for community purposes, having this GPL software uh, um, op operating somewhere else, it's an interesting it's an interesting question you are raising here. For one and one, we internally do the manual way at the moment. We have our own cluster manager. I will mention it later. So uh, hopefully there are no more questions to, for this slide. So it should be clear, hopefully, what then happens. And now, what does uh, cluster, uh, cluster demand is clear. Flexible mass sharding is now all clear. And what's background migration? The idea can be seen here. You have this primary side logical volume three here. Of course, you have another replica at the old data center which has failed at the moment, for example. And you are just creating a third replica on this machine on the same where you're already exporting via ISCSI, provided you have enough storage space. And this replication is doing a full sync, similar than DRBD also does a full sync in background. While, this, while your data is being modified by your application, your block device, logical volume. So in this, and after some hours, or if it's a very big, a huge device, then it may take one day. We have some up to 40 terabyte logical volumes in some cases at the moment, and some very big boxes uh, with uh, 300 terabytes uh, in total on one box. So 48 spindle, or even some machines even have 60 spindles, uh, RAID systems, several RAID sets on one machine. High capacity ones and lower capacity for better performance and similar things. So after a while, you will have it up to date. Up, similar, same notion as with DRBD. You know this up to date from DRBD already. So the same as with Mars. And well, the next step is not 
depicted here, but you can imagine. What will what will I do then? Last step is switch the primary rules to here, and this ISCSI connection is not needed anymore. And this is just the idea of the background migration. Create a temporary additional replica, additional, so we can even start with one replica and never create another replica at all, but if you have to migrate it, even the, uh, then you have a temporary second replica, and after what, of course, you are destroying your old replica. There are some commands like Mars RDM, uh, join resource and leave resource, and similar commands have already appeared in DRBD. So it's, this is no accident because uh, I'm in contact with Philip Reisner from Linbit, Linbit and some the feel, look and feel from sysadmin perspective should be very similar of both products. So that's the basic idea. You are not using a big cluster. You are migrating the data explicitly upon your request as a sysadmin. You are telling the system where you, the data should be should reside. You can migrate it at any time to anywhere as you like. So you have a big cluster at the metadata level. That means all the resources in your big cluster are known where they are residing, but the actual data path, the actual I.O. is not a big cluster I.O. The actual data is where possible only local with no network at all and only in those places where needed you are using the network. That's the basic idea. Well. Now my last slides, the second last one. What's Mars? It's under GPL. Well, I have a 100-page manual on GitHub. You can download it, read it. I have also some sysadmin instructions, uh, how to step-by-step -step instructions, how to set up your first Mars cluster and so on, very similar to DRBD. If you already know DRBD, it's, you will be fa become familiar with it. There's some detail. Uh, some, some, some differences in detail because of the asynchronous uh, modes of Mars, uh, where you expect that in DRBD if something is done synchronously, you have asynchronous versions in Mars also. And uh, okay, it's stable because it's in production since more than two years, or uh, three years now. Uh, the one and one geo redundancy feature is public in our publi public uh, advertising. Probably you noticed it, we have geo redundancy in, in our. Um, in our advertising, this, this is just the backbone of it. Um, we have more than 2,000 servers. Um, no, it, the databases are even more. So this number is too low. It's, it's even more because the databases are also, data, separate databases servers are also replicated via Mars. So I, I think it should be more than 3,000, 3,500 in total. This is wrong, e even too low. Then uh, the capacity, the installed, uh, the installed capacity is even higher, uh, more than 8 petabytes of data. Uh, interesting for you is the number of inodes here. Um, web hosting means that you have extremely many, 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 many very small files. Okay, and the only file system which uh, is really has a low error rate here is XFS, not ZFS, not ButterFS, <laughs> and so on. X4 has some problems as we know. So we are using XFS, and uh, Mars has now more than 30 millions of operating hours uh, on the, the big cluster and the big systems. It's more for more than two years now. Okay. Uh, what we are currently doing, our internal project, is uh, increasing density and saving costs, and this means uh, that the migration is now the current wor uh, work I'm working at the moment. Uh, there's one old branch, this is called stable branch, which has been in production for, and this has collected this number of operating hours and we are now for two weeks using the new, it's uh, even in, uh, officially it's an alpha stage, but already in production for two years now, uh, for two weeks now. And of course in a, f in a few months I will label it beta and hopefully by about end of the year I will also label it stable. So it's collecting some experiences, of course, <coughs> maybe a little bit higher incident rate at the first new versions, new functionality, but the experience is uh, that uh, the reliability of the software is higher than of the hardware. And this has to be if you are creating an HA solution. The software has to be more reliable than the hardware, otherwise it's not HA, it's no high availability, 
high availability. So this is just a, a requirement for the software. Well, future plans. <coughs> what I'm thinking about in there, I would like to have some feedback from you. What we, I'm starting bottom up here. Uh, what's already done, we have been starting with DRBD some years ago and migrated to Mars because of some network problems. So uh, you can imagine that if you do data centers and you have uh, several lines, 10 gig lines, several, I think we have more than eight between them, whatever it is, but there's a lot of other traffic. It has nothing to do with your web hosting, with different applications, with whatever. And this means that you are running sometimes, at, so backup is running and whatever is running, so you have some peak loads there, and also peak loads occurring at your DRBD replication, then you have a problem. And in another talk, I, I have even a slide about it. What then happens if you are, uh, if DRBD is overloaded? So if you replace it by Mars, that was the reason why I created Mars some years ago, started the Mars project. What we are currently doing is this one. So we are creating a virtual LVM-like virtual pool where you can migrate. So, so load balancing is done by migrating and virtual machine pools. At the moment, we have our own cluster manager CM3, which is not ready for publication. I would like to, uh, to, to have it published. It's created by a different team than me. Uh, but it's, uh, I think it's not possible because it relies on the internal infrastructure, on certain databases, instances even, in our internal infrastructure, and this is not for, 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 public, uh, for publication. It doesn't help anyone. That's the problem here. So what I'm thinking about is having a libvirt plugin. I already have a better version of it, but not yet fully tested. So if you have a, uh, there's already a, a libvirt plugin for DRBD, and the Mars one is not, it's very similar. It's not totally different fr from it, but somebody has to test it, and my time is, is limited. So I would like to have some feedback from the community here, if possible. The interesting new point is, just your question before, what about automatic load balancing? Not only failure scenarios, but also, but also load balancing and the like. So now there's a question, this is to be done. Separate implementation, hopefully under GPL and published at GitHub, would, I would prefer it, or going into existing projects like Word or OpenStack or Kubernetes, for example. Why not, if it is easily possible? So I would like to collect some feedback from you. What would you prefer? Well, not all of you probably have this application area of thousands of servers, <laughs> but <laughs> if you if you have a wish list and could just make make your check marks somewhere, what what would you prefer? No opinions, no preferences. Okay, this is, well, uh, you can also talk to me offline or send me an email. So this, this is just a question I'm, I'm asking, and um, probably I should g gain more experience with that. I have a lot of experience with our own system, but not with uh, new systems uh, growing on the green meadow. So be be because I'm working on a very old system, which is in operation for decades now, and uh, has some history, of course, and, some, uh, and what, whatever is happening there. So this means uh, it's a, a complete difference whether I'm working in an area where um, a traditional system is very stable uh, with, uh, with processes, with ITIL processes and so on, uh, and rollout is, is no easy story there. To, to get something, a kernel rollout is, is really a mess there, but, but, uh, you, uh, but thanks to geo redundancy, no, no big problem, you can switch over. So you are starting at the passive side, you are putting the, kernel, the new kernel at the passive side and then just hand over. But even if you have 2,000 of machines and you have an error rate of whatever, it's less than one, let's say one per mil, not even one percent, then you have, you have to look after it. Because if you have several thousands of machines, fully automatic load balancing has some, has some risks. Yeah, that's the problem here. So uh, your reliability has really to be really extremely high there at, at this area. So this is my last slide. Any questions? Yes. You said you changed from DRBD to, to Mars. Mars because of network problems. Yes. Uh, the question was, uh, I said we switched uh, from DRBD to Mars because of network problems. Uh, the question yeah. continues. Yes. The 
small question again. You said you changed from DRBD to Mars due to network problems. The question is, was these network problems for the geo redundancy part or so on the one side or on the LAN side internal in one data center? Um, no. It's really for the geo redundancy. Uh, I can confirm that DRBD works very well with cross over cables. It's constructed for that case. DRBD is simply not constructed for long distance replication and we have some kind of long distance, we have high latency and we have no constant latencies here. In case of traffic jams and, so, and similar, similar events there, it's simply not constructed for this case and that was the reason why there is a niche for, for mouse. Yep. Stated simply. So, and uh, this is also the reason why I'm trying uh, to be uh, um, to some degree compatible to, to DRBD as much as possible because many sysadmins are used. It has some reputation in, in the community. DRBD has some reputation. Mars is a relatively new product, open source product, so has to gain some reputation, of course. So it's best for, for me, I think, uh, to do something similar and I'm also in contact with Linbit in, in this case. So. I think um, this is the right way to go. Uh, it's a sister, I am regarding DRBD as a sister. I'm even recommending DRBD in the cases where it's uh, better seated. If you have crossover cables, don't use Mars. Then use DRBD. But if you are planning uh, high long distances, if you have more than one router in between or one, more than one switch in between, and if your total throughput of all of your switch ports together is more than uh, you, your, your intermediate connection is more than order, one order of magnitude lower than the total, then you should also consider mouse. Mm -hmm. Looking into it, having some POC, some proof of concept, looking into it, gaining some experience, and then slowly migrating, as we have done. If you have some operational problems, never touch running system, you know. <laughs> it's also clear. <laughs> But in case you have an alternative, and uh, our migration, I can tell some more stories. The first uh, point was uh, uh, we have ITIL, that means we have to be able to roll back at any time. And this is possible. Because it's a drop in replacement, uh, in some sense, not, not completely, because there's a separate space for the slash SMARS directory. But the DRBD metadata is on separate volumes. And if you have it on separate, the, the separate uh, LV, uh, logical volumes for the metadata, it's no problem to use MARS as a drop in replacement for DRBD. And migrating even thousands of instances was no problem. I wrote some migration script and it was two nights, one for the European cluster, big cluster, and the other one for the US cluster, and uh, it, it, we migrated more than 98% in one night, and there were some, some remains uh, who had, they had problems which was, was then migrated later. So you have to automate it if you have really some thousands of machines, of course, yeah. Um, I have some more war stories, if you like, if you no, no more questions about big clusters. This is interesting for you. A very old experience. Probably you know one product of one and one called my website. Uh, it started several years ago and uh, it's uh, partly written in Java and partly written in PHP. Uh, it's a very heterogeneous system and it started on the Green Meadow. It was a big cluster architecture but with a low number of machines. So we had two storage servers and about I think six client servers in total. And they are, starting, they are starting with NFS. So it's a big cluster architecture by, by, the na by its nature. But of course it's not really big. Yeah, it's a small one. And after it grew to about, I think, I don't remember exactly, about 20,000 customers and their behavior, it started to have incidents. And the problem is always the same. You look at, start, uh, you look at Netstat and you see there's a TCP send buffer somewhere at the server side and suddenly whoosh, there's a peak, yes, it's going up. And after a while it's going down. So it's ha some, some, some hanging, some, 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 some hanging there. And experienced sysadmins, uh, as you probably are, you, you know the problem, it's also your experience. What's the problem is the TCP send buffer and it's not the real time. It's TCP is no real time protocol. So what did they do? The sysadmins at their own started to replace NFS with OCFS2. 
Oh, no, no, don't laugh. OCFS2 is better than NFS, obviously, because it scaled, the, the, the scalability, first scalability limit with NFS was about 2,000, uh, 2,000, uh, uh, 20,000 customers. And uh, the OCFS2 was working until about 30 or 35,000 customers. Then the same problems, same picture as before. What did they do? They looked around, they used cluster FS with G. Okay. And as you probably know from, from talks about cluster FS, it's better than NFS, and I can confirm yes, this is true. And cluster FS worked, what do you think? <laughs> about 50, more than 60,000 customers on these boxes, and then the same problem as before. So it was a typical startup project, starting now, nowadays we have uh, half a million, I think, 10 times more in, in the meantime. So what did I do? I noticed I, I got involved into the project. I talked with the application architect, not the system architect, but application architect. And I explained to him the very first slide about big cluster and this O of N square network. I was explaining to you. And he immediately was, oh yes, this is O of N square. True, by concept. Now what do we need? We need a sharding architecture. What did he do? He converted the whole architecture to sharding, in this case sharding of small clusters, because there's already some cluster, clustering there, and what do you think? It works until today. In scale, and even if we would need to scale up by another order of magnitude, 10 times more customer, we would be lucky <laughs> if it would happen, but technically it's no problem <laughs> to scale up, because sharding always scales by, very, by its definition. Yeah? So if sharding does not scale, then the internet does not scale. Sharding scales like the internet. When sharding does not help, then the internet doesn't, that does not work anymore. It, it's the same problem in, in essence. So this is what I want um, to tell you. Big clusters have their merits. They have even their application areas. There are use cases for it, depending on the type of work. But if you don't need them, don't use them. That's the bottom line. Any more questions? Then thank you for your attention.